Welcome to the UC Washington Center, UCDC. This is an extraordinary institution here in the heart of Washington, D.C., the University of California's Washington Center, where students and faculty come to learn about the federal government and to do research on politics and policy in America. Uh, we're lucky to have here today Dorothy Robine, who's had a number of extraordinary posts in the federal government, uh, also taught at Harvard University, uh, been worked in Congress at the Office of Technology Assessment, Joint Economic Committee, and, and then went on to various posts in government, including my favorite, I'll have to read this here, Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Installations and Environment. <laughs> I must say my first thought was installations are like art installations, is that what you were doing? <laughs> right. So what yeah. were you doing with that job? Yeah. So installations is uh, DOD, Department of Defense speak for military base. Mm -hmm. um, that's how most people think of it. The Department of Defense uh, has a huge footprint. They have uh, 300,000 buildings, two, two point something billion square feet of space. That's about three times as much as uh, all the Ma Walmarts anywhere in the world. Uh, 28 million uh, acres of land. They, they, they're, they have a large presence in the United States and also abroad. So I was the senior person in DOD overseeing uh, military bases and all the related issues. Okay, but so it says installations and the? Environment, so yes. So tell me about yes, that. Yes, well, um, so the installations are uh, where there are endangered species and all kinds of activities that affect the env environment and that are affected by the environment. Um, so the Department of Defense is actually a very, very good environmental steward because they have these 28 million acres of land uh, and they're not gonna get any more and so they take very good care of it. I mean, they blow stuff up, but they, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but they're actually, people in the environmental, true environmentalists uh, know that they recognize the Department of Defense as a very, very important uh, partner. There are something like uh, 450 threatened and endangered species uh, found on military bases and about 40 some are found only on mm. military bases. What's happened is that you've had population encroachment in urban areas around bases and these threatened and endangered species have found their way on to the bases. Just retreated as, to as those retreated. areas. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so it is. it, it becomes in the um, interests of the Defense Department to take care of them so that they don't uh, get put on a list that requires DOD to curtail training and testing. So, so they're a very good partner. We want to talk about budgets. So how do yeah. all of this show up in your budgets? I mean, it's sort of odd because on the one hand, you're probably trying to get the minimum cost per square foot of space or something like that. But on the other hand, you're very worried about environmental and energy issues. Yes, yeah. So first of all, in budgetary terms or in financial terms, the f DOD facilities are huge. So it's an $850 billion portfolio, portfolio meaning that's the value of the bases and the, and the land and so forth. Um, the annual budget is, is less than that, but I oversaw what's called the MILCON budget, military construction. <laughs> there is a whole subcommittee of the uh, House Appropriations Committee devoted to MILCON, military construction. It is at times on the order of 20 to 25 billion dollars a year. It is not that high now, it's, it's cyclical, but we're ta you know, you're talking real money when you talk about um, the Defense Department and, and MILCON. Um, so the budget is a, is a, a big deal. Um, I mean, just the military bases consume, th their utility bill is $4 billion a year. Just that's, the uti that's right. electricity, that's the gas okay. and electricity to run the base. That doesn't count the oil that the planes are or the I'll fuel never that complain the about my using. utility bill again. I promise. Right. Yes. Um, but um, so my, you know, my my biggest interaction with uh, with the budget, uh, I um, it it had to do with the um, the scoring rules. The way that the federal government does not have a capital budget. Mm -hmm. uh, it it is it borrows money, but it borrows money for the in, to fund the deficit 
generally. It doesn't borrow money the way state and local governments or corporations mm -hmm. do to fund particular projects. Uh, and capital investments uh, are on a pay-as-you-go basis. They have to be funded up front. Overseeing physical infrastructure as the senior real property officer in the Department of Defense, that was a problem for me. I was constantly dealing with um, a situation where I had assets that were deteriorating and not enough money to invest in them. And uh, there's something called the rule of five that you know as a, a homeowner, if you mm -hmm. don't fix the leaky roof, um, it's going to cost you five times more when mm -hmm. you have to replace the roof. The same is true of military bases. And so this deferred maintenance is a, is a big, big problem. It's a big budgetary problem, and one way to deal with it is to um, do innovative things with the private sector, public-private public partnerships. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much um, forbidden by the, by the budget rules. There is one huge success story, and it was begun in the Clinton administration when I was in the Clinton White House, in that we, pri we allowed the Department of Defense to private, so-called privatize, it's not technically private, but privatize their, all of the family housing on military bases. There was a huge number of inadequate uh, family housing units on military bases all over the country. And it was clear the Defense Department wasn't going to be able to come up with the money to and invest And so that was a public-private partnership so to provide the capital yes. to do that and to make it possible to do it. To know, allow the, the military services to enter into public-private partnerships, and it's been a huge so success. So tell us about scoring. So what yeah. is that? Well, the, so the scoring rules uh, are the, they basically, scoring is a term for how you account for uh, budgetary expenditures and the, sc the scoring rules. Uh, it's scoring because it's, it's when, when do you score an expenditure and to what extent is it scored up front or do you have to fund it up front? And for the most part, with a few exceptions, investment in infrastructure and other forms of capital, R&D, training, all of that has to be funded up front as opposed to being paid for over time the way mm -hmm. that most entities do when you it comes to capital. You take out loans and then pay them back Ex and that exactly. kind of thing. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, so the scoring rules are a huge impediment and there is a debate going on now and I'm part of that debate to change the scoring rules and conceivably even have a capital budget for the federal government. There, 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 that debate has occurred before and the answer has always been no. Uh, I so are you trying to actually get a capital budget for the entire federal government no. or just start with the Defense Department and see? Uh, not just, I, I don't, so I don't think of it in agency terms, I think of it in terms of real property for the federal okay. government because I've had responsibility for real property, buildings, land, and the stuff in them. I've had that responsibility in two different agencies, the Department of Defense and the General Services Administration, which is the civilian arm of the federal government. And they have the same, the same problem. And so, so what, I'm, what I would like to see is relief from the scoring rules so that those agencies and other agencies with, with real property, with, with buildings and structures and infrastructure um, can can borrow and can can enter into public-private partnerships, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which are probably a more efficient way to manage a lot of federal uh, federal infrastructure. Indeed, the University of California right now is thinking about public-private partnerships for things that we're trying to do, specifically the Goldman School. Ah, that's actually excellent. something we have on the table for our third building. So yeah, um, so that's very interesting. Now, I just have to ask you. In, yeah. uh, at some, I noticed that you had once made a deal with Donald Trump. <laughs> so were you in the same yes. room with Donald Trump? Did you get a chance to meet I did, Mr. I did, Trump? I did, uh, only at the end. I dealt with Ivanka, Ivanka Trump, okay. and, and I dealt with Ivanka um, only when she was at her wits end in dealing with my agency or the city of Washington or something else. She would, she would call me, and, and I will say that, uh, that she, was, she was lovely. She, uh, I think, um, this is, this revolved around the old post office, uh -huh, which was built right. in 1899. It was never a building that the Washington, D.C. embraced, uh, and there were 
several different efforts to tear it down. Mm -hmm. One in the 30s This, by the way, is a building, just to say where it is, it's essentially midway between the White House and the Congress yes. on Pennsylvania Avenue. Exactly. So yeah. it's really an extraordinary building and yes. an extraordinary location. It's a gorgeous building. It's Richard Sonian Romanesque architecture that uh, was built at a time when Beaux Arts was just mm -hmm. uh, coming into fashion, and so uh, people at the time uh, didn't really love it. Uh, but it was the the last effort to tear it down in the in the 1960s and 70s gave rise to the don't tear it down movement, which became the Washington D.C.'s historic preservation movement. So the old post office was the it in don't tear it down. Mm -hmm. um, the federal government um, used the building for different purposes, but it never it was really a commercial white white elephant. And uh, so, uh, so before I got to the GSA, the General Services Administration, um, they held a competition. They said, we, we want to lease this. We want to do a 60-year lease of the building under the National Historic Preservation Act uh, and give us your, tell us what you would pay us in rent, what you would invest in the building. And so about eight or ten different companies, uh, all, all hotel mm -hmm. chains uh, bid, and it was very contested. This all happened before I got there. Mm -hmm. uh, to a lot of people's surprise, GSA picked the Trump organization, mm -hmm. and it was because they said they were going to invest $200 million in the building. So I got there during the time that uh, we were negotiating the lease. It took about a year to negotiate the lease, and we, we lawyered up a lot, as right. you could imagine, my yeah. boss and I. And uh, and they just they just opened uh, the building, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, you know I'm not a I'm not a Trump supporter, but I think they <laughs> did they did right by the building. We'll see if all of the the backlash affects the building's commercial opportunities. So we're we're talking about budget things, and often the federal government spends money to create public goods. And then those public goods are things that they, on an ongoing basis, help sustain. You were in, in, involved in an extraordinary situation while you were in the Clinton White House. You were in the National Economic Council, right. a staff member there. And you got involved with what was called the Iridium Project. And this was a project where there were satellites all around the Earth, about right. 70 of them or so. Um, and those satellites were going to provide cell service, mm -hmm. cell phone service, for everybody on Earth. And the distinguishing uh, feature of this was that you could do it anywhere on Earth, in the middle of the Sierra right. Desert, in the Antarctic, wherever. But Motorola invested billions in this. Yes. They tried to market it. It didn't work. And then it came to a point where they were going to decommission the satellites, which meant basically send them to Earth and destroy them. So this public good which had been created, these 70 or 80 satellites, which were capable of providing extraordinary service around the world, were going to be destroyed. You identified that as a public good, and then you had to deal with the difficult process <laughs> of getting a public good that had been produced by a private entity, somehow supported by the public sector in a situation where you didn't want that to look like you were basically providing a subsidy yes. for the private sector. Yes. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. Yes, yes, and this all uh, just, th this was all done kind of in secret at the time. This is in uh, the last year of the Clinton administration, 2000. And <coughs> it, it was successful, but we didn't brag about it. There was no, um, there, were, there was no victory lap. A book just came out um, about it, so it's getting, it's getting visibility. Um, it's called Eccentric e Orbits. Eccentric Orbits, the Iridium story. Um, you, you, looking back on it, you wonder, I mean, how, how could people have been thinking, why, how could anybody think about destroying a beautifully engineered $6 billion system? The reason was, it was a private system. Motorola was being run then by Chris Galvin, son of Bob Galvin. He was the, the one who oversaw the development of the system and, and was he was a visionary his and Paul Galvin the founder of Motorola Motorola was still a great company Chris Galvin thought it was a black mark on the company he thought it was affecting the stock price I don't think that's true but he wanted to bring these satellites down and he and was, he wanted uh, to treat it it was his 
It's private property, so yeah. we can do whatever we want yes. with it. And you and the White House said, no, it's yeah. not private property. Yeah. You are, by the way, at least as I read the book, the heroine of the book. There's a, <laughs> another person who's the hero of the well, book. Yeah. There's both a hero and a heroine. <laughs> yeah, well, the hero, Dan Colusi, who really saved the system. But we were we were closely together, and and there again. You know, the Department of Defense was the key, and I knew that from day one. I mm -hmm. had, I had, um, I had, uh, I had been working with Iridium on a variety of issues having to do with getting their license and doing the first call with the vice president. So, DoD was the anchor tenant, if you will, for Iridium. They had a uh, a secure gateway in Hawaii. They had invested in a secure handset, so they had spent several hundred million dollars to be a customer. So Not what does it mean to be a secure one. handset? What was that? What was the virtue of that? Well, actually, I don't think you needed that because of the the beauty of there's two phenomenal things about uh, the Iridium satellite system that make it unlike any other entity, and in, in particular, its competitor, Global Star. One is it covers every inch of the planet, and uh, in particular, po polar coverage, which no other satellite does. Other satellite systems focus on where the people are. Right. The head of Global Star used to say, yep, Iridium's got the penguin market cornered. <laughs> uh, but it turns out if you're at the Department of Defense, you care about the penguin, you know, where penguins are because you've got activity going on. So right. polar coverage. And then the calls are relayed from one satellite to another. They only come to ground at, at the very end. What that means is that someone cannot geolocate a call. If a soldier makes a call from an unnamed country, uh, a, no one can trace where that call came from. That's a huge thing for the Department of Defense. So if you're in Afghanistan, yes. out in the boonies someplace and desperate to try to get help, yes. this is a mechanism you can use and not fear that somebody's going to figure out yes. where you are because exactly. of that. Yeah. So DOD had signed up for it. They liked they liked it, but when when Iridium went bankrupt, um, they were not willing to initially at least step up. And they certainly they looked at buying the system themselves, and they decided no, we don't want to run it. Um, what we needed from the Department of Defense, one, we needed uh, them to con continue to be a customer, and that really wasn't a big lift. It was about thirty million dollars a year. But we all ultimately figured out what we needed was for them to indemnify Motorola. So what the reason Motorola wanted to deorbit the satellites is that they had an, a very, very good insurance policy that was going to run out in a couple of years. And the satellites normally wouldn't come down for another 10, 10 15 years. They've actually outlasted that by a long shot. Uh, so Motorola wanted to deorbit them while they had this insurance policy in place. They wanted a buyer. They were happy to sell it, but they wanted a buyer that had a deep pocket and that could provide that indemnification. And no, there were no deep pocketed buyers. There were some. Just, uh, just on yeah. this fact, mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's ever died from a satellite coming well, to Earth. <laughs> right. That's a true statement. Yes, I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yes. No. I know. And it's, not that much property has even been affected. Maybe yes. littered, but that's about it. Yes. Right. Yeah. But you know, it's it's funny how the the debate within the federal government became all about risk because you can quantify that, mm -hmm. a, as opposed to what what possibilities are there for this? And so it was a remarkably narrow debate. So ultimately, you got the Defense Department in a meeting that's recounted in the book, which includes <laughs> an extraordinary moment where the second in command at the Defense Department turns to the Motorola people say and says, if you just keep making threats about destroying this system, you're going to have a hard time yes. getting business at the Defense Department. Right. And it's said rather provocatively. Yes, about us, so. yes. <laughs> right. Um, so that meeting was the culmination of months and months of effort. I mean, by that time, in my view, we had we had won the battle. The battle was to get the Defense Department to get on board. And the Deputy Secretary, I think he was secretly on board all along, but he was the COO, in effect, of the department. And he had a lot of people in the department that did not want to do this. You had you know, three and four star Air Force generals who they like their military unique systems. They were so not So they wanted to build enamored. their own system. Yeah. Well, now let's fast forward. Yeah. So at 9-11, yeah. 
Was yeah. it important to have Iridium? Yeah, yeah. So 9-11, um, only phone that worked in New York. Hurricane Katrina, only phone that worked in New Orleans. The uh, 2010 earthquake in Haiti, 50 international organizations showed up with Iridium phones. That was the moment where it became clear that Iridium phones had become mm -hmm. standard operating equipment for disaster relief. Um, I had a, a, a guy come up to me in September uh, at uh, a defense installation at, after the author gave a talk and, and talked about me, and he said, uh, he said I, I want to thank you. He said, I'm a Navy SEAL. I didn't need my Iridium phone until I needed my Iridium phone. It saved my life. Hmm. Um, and you, you hear those stories. It is not unusual to hear those stories. The only time ir Iridium phones were very important uh, in, uh, as a way for soldiers to communicate with their families. In, hmm. in addition to being able to communicate with one another, uh, they became the, the way that soldiers hmm. could talk to their families. And they're the only time that the system has ever um, failed for having too many calls. It was on Mother's Day <laughs> in 2008, maybe, when uh, an inordinate number of people in, in one country, I believe it was, it would have been in Afghanistan, uh, tried, to call. tried to call home, yeah. But so, so that's a fascinating story about how sometimes budgets and, and just yeah. even standard public policy practices can't even begin to imagine the complexity of a public policy issue because you took what looked like a private sector bankruptcy issue really yeah. and identified that it had this very strong public policy, public goods component and that that meant that government had to intervene and right. get involved. Yeah. How did you, was that obvious from the beginning or did you just? Well, it was, um, it, you know, it's, it's the money has been spent. It's a it's a so beautiful that was part of the trick. system. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean it. It's sort of common sense. I mean, I'd like yeah. to think it's my my Goldman School training, right. but and it certainly it certainly was. But it it was, you know, it was an amazingly engineered system that didn't work commercially. It had a so right. it, th there was nothing wrong with the technology. The problem was with the business the business plan, but the idea that you would destroy that, I mean, that's why we have the bankruptcy right. laws. If this had been a terrestrial system, there wouldn't have been an issue. It w y the bankruptcy laws would have kicked in and somebody would have, you know, it would have, it would have worked out very easily. It was only because these things were several hundred miles up in the sky that it became an issue. I w one other interesting angle, and this did make it tricky is that there was a competitor, namely Global Star. Global Star was headed by a guy named uh, Bernie Bernard Schwartz, big friend of President Clinton, big contributor. Uh, and, uh, and he was crying foul. And White House Counsel's Office told me, um, and they told others as well, do not get involved in the bankruptcy. Limit your role to the safety issues related mm. to the deorbiting. Stay out of the bankruptcy. That is the only time in my eight-year career in the White House that I ignored the White House Counsel's <laughs> Office. <laughs> I felt like right. somebody had my back. Well, uh, l let me just say, it, just to give you my sense of what it looks like to me, it looks like you were the John Muir who noticed that Yosemite <laughs> is worth preserving. <laughs> And that a lot of people didn't recognize it, and they would have just been as happy to drown it in a new lake bed with a dam there, and that is to say, deorbit the satellites. And you noticed that wasn't the right thing to do. And so yeah. uh, it's that kind of originality and imagination that's really quite extraordinary. And that's also things that you did when you were at the Defense Department with the installations, because you also tried to do a lot of things with respect to environmental sustainability and energy sustainability. I think of you as one of those people who has just big ideas <laughs> and figures out ways to bring the public and the private sector together. And I'd yeah. just have a, like to have a quick rendition of how you got there. So Iridium's a big idea. Yeah. The uh, energy sustainability in, in government the defense buildings is a big idea. You've also talked to me at times about your big ideas with respect to airplanes and the guidance systems to make that system work better. Where did that come from? I and mean, wh have you consciously done that, or is that just some <laughs> well, of these things pop into your mind, and and then you get an oots about them? Because I mean, it's no small thing 
to push for the iridium system. I yeah. mean, that was months, if well, not years of effort. It's interesting you characterize it as big ideas because I think my strength is that I get in the weeds and I, I am really attentive to detail. I mean, it, you do have to have a vision, but I think what distinguishes me from a lot of people is, my, is the degree to which I, you know, nights and weekends <laughs> am writing memos and email. I mean, it, you know, the Iridium book, it's just, it wasn't mm -hmm. the big idea. It was just all the tactical things that, that had to be No, done. but you identified it as a public good. Yeah. That was yes. a big idea. Yeah. I mean, I think it comes directly out of my, my Goldman training. I have a, uh, I have a strong sense of where government should f should focus and what the private sector should do. And you know, I am a very market-oriented Democrat and I've spent my career trying to actually get government out of those things where they don't need to be involved. I wrote my dissertation at Goldman on deregulation of the trucking mm -hmm. industry, which followed quickly after airline deregulation, and I would argue both have been big, big successes. Uh, and I think there are other areas where you could do that. I've been trying for 20 years uh, to get the air traffic control system out of the Federal Aviation Administration. It's a monopoly. Uh, it's not like the airline industry where you have competition. It is not an inherently governmental activity. Regulating the safety of the aviation industry, that is inherently governmental. That is what the FAA needs mm -hmm. to do. They do not need to be keeping planes apart. That is a 24 seven high-tech service business. When we tried to spin it off in the Clinton administration in the mid-90s, only four other countries had done that. Now, and we, we failed, we failed uh, uh, miserably. Uh, and now the rest of the world has done that. The United States is mm -hmm. one of the few countries that has not done that. Um, so I, I have often um, gone against um, Democrats in Congress who, who oppose some of, uh, you know, I was on the, the other side of, of them. But, uh, um, you know, I, it, this, this very much goes back to my Goldman training about what, what is inherently governmental, what, where can you draw on the, on the market, mm -hmm. where can you take advantage of the, of the market to accomplish um, public, public sector goals. So I want to thank you, Dorothy Rubine, a big thinker <laughs> who becomes a big thinker by getting into the weeds and yes. knowing the details. But I think the two are connected. Yeah. But you always have a vision. You know that you're trying to do something big and you're going to learn all the details so you can do that big thing. So I thank you for your extraordinary public service and the big ideas that you've had. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you.